this Sabbath, uh, I want to look at uh, a little bit more detail into the elect. And, uh, you know, the number that we strive to be in. We're the elect now, um, but we still have duty. We still have to keep our, uh, our lamps trimmed because all ten of the virgins had oil. But only five of them were serious about keeping it up and keeping it uh, well filled, if you will. And so, you know, as I think on this, I wonder, how many people even realize when the Lord Jesus made the decision to not just be our Creator, our Lord, or even our Teacher, He also made the decision way back before any of us were even born to die for us. If, in fact, we made the bad choice to sin. You know, before He created man. Well, as we know, Adam and Eve made the bad choice. And thanks to that bad choice, we have been dealing with sin and death for the last 6,000 years. Uh, and so that all being said... How long ago did Jesus, his Father, and the Holy Spirit discuss the need for Christ to die? You know, so as to offer salvation, if in fact mankind was to sin. Sister White goes into this as well, but uh, it's in Scripture, so, you know, that's either way, it's, it's a good place uh, to look into it. So, Paul stated this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then verse 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know, this means that before Adam and Eve were even created, the gift of salvation was agreed upon out of love for all of us before any of us were even born. You know, that gift stretches all the way until the last person accepts or rejects the truth, you know, directly before plague number one begins. And uh, if they keep pushing the way they're pushing, those that plague number one is going to uh, start, you know, 2029, 20, 2030, 20, something like that. So, uh, as we just, you know, learned that, uh, you know, to get the salvation stretches all the way from, you know, the days that uh, Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden till plague number one. Uh, and by the way, did you notice that it says in verse four that I just read that we should be holy and without blame before him in love? The only way to get to that point is, of course, to meet the Lord, accept him as Savior, and then study his word daily so as to learn more about the one we were created to love you know, the most, and then pray to him, as did the patriarchs and prophets of gold, which, which of course, was three times a day. So as to let him know that we love him so much that we, we really want to keep him in our day, you know. I mean, yeah, a lot of us, myself included, we pray all day, all day, every hour, every half hour, every 15 minutes, every five, you know, especially if certain situations are happening in life. But uh, a lot of us, like myself, talk to him all day long. And uh, but still to put the you know special time aside just to be with him and him alone, uh, yeah, that's something that uh, really does bless us, uh, as well as studying the word, you know, because uh, you certainly can't grow uh, without knowing what his will is. I mean, the elect grows to a point that it becomes part of their life to study and pray daily because the love we have for him compels us to spend as much time as we can with him. Uh, especially when we grow to see how he opens up the word to us uh, in study and and his will to us in prayer each and every day. You know, even though we're living in the last times, you know, the last days, very, very trying times, and it's going to get a lot worse, uh, especially when you heard, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm doing a video on this, but the blog in, in, in regards to where that uh, that one person said something to the effect, it wasn't the Nazis that started... Uh, you know, the, the Nazis just all of a sudden come around and start beating on and killing the Jews. No, their neighbors did it first. That's why you see what's happening in the U.S. of A. And so we're in very, very trying times right now. It's going to get a lot worse because they have to build up that hatred. And then a Democrat actually praised Hitler the other day. So that's going to be in the video, too. I didn't, I didn't mention it in the blog because I just got the article. And so, again, we're living in trying times, and the promised peace of salvation is very real because as difficult as it is, it's even like that analogy I always bring up in regards to the twin brothers walking down the road, and they know what time it is, or they don't really know. One of them knows what time it is because he's a Christian, and the other one doesn't. 
Uh, they both have the same amount of children. They both have children. They want to go and have careers in life or whatever. Um, you know, because back then they could have a, ca- a career when I first came up with that analogy. But now that uh, there's a very strong possibility we're going to be home in New Jerusalem within nine years. And so there's not a lot of career choices out there for children at that point. Uh, but still, the analogy holds true where they're both walking down the street and one of the guys is extremely fearful because he doesn't trust Christ and he wants to stick a gun in his mouth, whereas his brother, he's happy-go-lucky because, wow, we'll be home soon. Because we can see, I mean, it's so real, this, this piece is so real, in fact, that we can clearly understand why Daniel, who knew the writing was signed that demanded the people must pray to the king or be tossed into the lion's den, he knew this. Now, he wasn't there. He wasn't privy to the discussion. He wasn't privy. He, he wasn't in the room when, when, when the, um, Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, or no, wait, I think that was uh, the next king, Cyrus. I get the kings mixed up all the time. But um, he knew about it, but he wasn't there when they had the discussion as to saying that, okay, everybody's got to pray to him instead of the, any kind of God. Later on, he found out about it, and he still prayed to the Lord because his love of the Lord was very real. He trusted him. He had no fear of being tossed into the lion's den, just as his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no they had so much love for the Lord that they had no fear when they knew that they would be tossed into the furnace. Uh, you know, and so that is a heart after God's own heart. I mean, a heart that trusts and loves the Lord, that that nothing can sway us off the path. And this is one of the reasons I keep praying for the latter rain upon myself, my wife, and children, and you guys. I mean my brothers and sisters in the faith, the brethren. Because, uh, yeah, we have a desire now to do it, but will we have the courage when that day comes? Well, yeah, we will. If we stay in the Bible every day and we pray every day, uh, he's going to know we're serious and so he can use us. And so, yeah, the latter rain will be upon us and then we'll get, oh, just the courage will be off the chart. You'll understand how easy, easy it was for Peter to walk up and say, yeah, hang me upside down. Don't crucify me right side up. Or even... Uh, uh, Daniel going into the lion's den. So that the heart of the elect is, of course, we hope to grow into the you know the heart of to be in the number of the Gideon band, and uh, and so if the enemy of souls, like I said earlier, gets his way by 2027, they'll start enforcing the mark, and then 2030 is uh, when they uh, do the they enforce the death decree that they have the bill that was passed prior, months prior, or a year prior. We don't know. It's going to be like the book of Esther. And so we are all being tested and tried to see if the Lord can use us in the coming days. And not just during the loud cry, but in eternity as well. I mean, check it out. Daniel chapter 7. It says this. uh, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass, uh, shall not pass away, and his kingdom shall, which shall not be destroyed. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. I mean, think about what Daniel just said here. For all the people, nations, and language to serve him means we will have, we will all have a blessed work to do for eternity, all of eternity. You know, when I saw this, I had to praise the Lord that the work I love to do will be continued throughout eternity if I stay faithful. And just so you know, I do plan to remain in Christ. And so this is just yet another reason why we all need to seek him and to know him as well and understand his word. I mean, now notice this. Whenever it's too cold or rainy outside, I like to go upstairs into my bedroom to pray. Uh, lately, the Lord has had me reading scripture or spirit of prophecy from time to time as I start prayer so as to learn more of his will or just have a topic to discuss because a lot of times I'm just, I just want to be there with him, you know? And I can't really think of anything because, man, I pray a lot, you know? And so it's 
not like I haven't brought this one up before, and so I go into it, right? And it's, but anyway, a few weeks ago, I was in the testimonies to the church uh, when, I, when I began my prayer with, with him. And I came across something that hit me like a ton of golden bricks from the streets of heaven that I believe we all, myself included, need to hear as we seek to be of the elect that partake in that number. Now, I'm not going to read the entire chapter as it is a bit long, uh, but I will share this from Testimonies for the Church, volumes, uh, Volume 1, uh, pages 260 and 261. Now, just for to set this up, uh, from what I understand, this book was penned in the year 1855. Uh, the Civil War was fought between the years 1861 and 1865. And I share this because she's literally prophesied about the war in this chapter right at the start. But then she goes directly into what she saw for our day. All right? Um, the testimony of Volume 1, page 260, paragraph 1. It says, I saw greater distress in the land than we have yet witnessed. I heard groans and cries of distress and saw large companies in active battle. I heard the booming of the cannon, the clash of arms, the hand-to-hand -hand fight, it's obviously civil war, and the groans and prayers of the dying. The ground was covered with the wounded and the dead. I saw desolate, despairing families and pinching want in many dwellings. Even now, many families are suffering want, but this will increase. The faces of many looked haggard and paled and pinched with hunger. Think about this, because they're, they're purposely, as a matter of fact, I just got a hot mic. One of the brothers, I think it was... Uh, I don't remember which brother sent me this, but um, there was a hot mic in the uh, White House when the reporters were going back and forth talking about how the numbers came in for COVID. And this just happened the other day. And the COVID, and, and not only do they say it was 0.1% to 0.3%, one of them actually said, yeah, that's right in line with regular flu. But yet they're still going to push it as if it's a, 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 like an epidemic or a pandemic, right? Because they're going to—they have to destroy the economy. That's what they did in the Civil War too. The, the economy, with people, like that's what he said, pinching with hunger, no food, right? So anyway, she goes on to say that I was shown that the people of God should be closely united in the bonds of Christian fellowship and love. God alone can be our shield and strength in this time of our national calamities. The people of God. I think about calamity. She wouldn't have, they weren't having no calamities back then. All right? All right, so she says, The people of God should awake. The opportunities to spread the truth should be improved, for they will not last long. We don't have a lot of time to work, is what she's saying. I was shown distress and perplexity and famine in the land. Satan is now seeking to hold God's people in a state of inactivity. I mean, look at the SDA church. You know, oh, don't even bother talking about Sunday laws until they pass them. No, that's not what the prophecy said. They pass them to try to shut us up because we're talking about Sunday laws. And so Satan's now seeking to hold God's people in a state of inactivity to keep them from acting their part in spreading the truth, that they may at last be weighed in the balance and found wanting. So, God's people must take warning and discern the signs of the times. The signs of Christ's coming are too plain to be doubted, and in view of these things, everyone who professed the truth should be a living preacher. But uh, stopping here for a moment, I, I, I cannot help but worry about the precious SDA people as, as well as all the Protestant churches who are under many false prophets who make merchandise of them. And I, I've spoken to many SDAs over the years and many have told me that they do not have to leave the cities or even warn the people of the Sunday laws until the powers that be actually start passing Sunday laws. Their apostate leaders have left their post to stand in their, bank, uh, to stand in their banks collecting cash to the point the Lord not only removed their understanding of the signs of the times, that's why they got the Bible on C3, they didn't even see a warning there. They have been preaching exactly, these guys have been preaching exactly what Satan wants the people to hear, in that he doesn't want them out there warning the people even now, because just as students prophecy know, Satan also knows that he doesn't get the powers that be to pass Sunday laws until after the latter rain blesses us with the utterance that cuts every heart we speak to that then causes many to leave the fallen churches to embrace Jesus as Lord, as well as allow the Holy Spirit to write the laws on their hearts. These poor people are worshiping their pastors above the Creator 
in that they trust them with their eternal lives, and Satan is happy as a lark that they do this. Now notice what she says next. Okay, so she goes on. She says, God calls upon all, both preachers and people, to awake. All heaven is astir. All right, so the scenes of earth's history are fast closing. We are, now again, here we're seeing that <laughs> she's talking about our day. So she says, we are amid the perils of the last days. Greater perils are before us, and yet we are not awake. This lack of activity and earnestness in the cause of God is dreadful. This death stupor is from Satan. He controls the mind of unconsecrated Sabbath keepers and leads them to be jealous of one another, fault-finding and, and, and censorious. Well, stopping here again. How many times have we seen Sabbath-keeping people that have verbally assaulted us and even made videos and wrote articles in magazines to try to make us look bad so as to prevent the truth we share from reaching more hearts? They make us look like idiots and cults. or what? I mean, brothers and sisters, this is no mistake. The fact that there, there were so very many that have done this in, in and outside of our church alone, and yet those of us that remain in obedience are still being blessed of God, proving we are a threat, and these poor souls have, taken, have been taken by Satan to try and darken the path we tread. But continuing where she, uh, it, she says this, it is a special work, and you know that's for Satan, to divide hearts that the influence, strength, and labor of God's servants may be kept among unconsecrated Sabbath keepers and their precious time to be occupied in settling little differences when it should be spent to proclaim the truth to unbelievers. See, this is why the people that are attacking us over the years, like Aiken, uh, they are, they, they, that's where they focus. That's the bulk of their, their, their message now. I mean, there's people out there that literally made websites just to slam me. Uh, one college professor wrote a book, How to Deal with Guys Like Nicholas. And that's required reading, right? And it's not just me. It's we all believe the same thing. But he like they like to they go after the the pastor, I guess. But she finishes by saying, "I was shown God's people waiting for some change to take play, uh, uh, place, a compelling power to take hold of them. But they're gonna, you know, they will be disappointed for they are wrong." You know, so, like I said earlier, the people in the SDA church are waiting for sunny laws before doing anything to warn the people. The Lord is watching them fail. And he is wa he's even watching each of us as we speak to see who he can use you know, in the loud cry. I mean, seriously, if you're, if you're not doing the work now, when it's, when it's time to actually go forth in the loud cry, you're not going to receive the latter rain because you showed you weren't serious or even cared enough about your fellow man until it, it got very obvious that the Sunday laws are, like, are, are here now, right? It, it's, like, it's no different than Ananias and Sapphira, if you think about it. I mean... Many Christians are like that. They're, they're stashing their cash and they're holding back their God-given talents and their abilities to help finish the work simply because they want a massive sign to occur before they really get serious. Because, you know, if you really think about it like Ananias and Sapphira, you know, they, they weren't really converted. They weren't really serious about their Christian walk. Because what if? You know, what if these apostles are all a bunch of fly-by-nights? You know, what if this is just all a flash in the pan? Yeah, stash the money, honey. And so they both dropped dead in the doorway. But all the signs are already seen now. We actually have thousands of articles and videos showing the Pope and all the 501c3 pastors are out there getting ready to enforce Sunday laws. And thanks to Trump signing the 501c3 bill into law on December 7th, that bill was written in 1954. Lyndon Johnson set it up. So it's no mistake, it was finally signed into law in 2017. I mean, come on. I mean, if I was preaching in 1954, a year before I was born, <laughs> I would have said prophecy fulfilled when Lyndon Johnson did it. But some people go, oh, no, 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 it's not law. No, no. Look, it's already a bill. We know what the Bible says. You don't have to sit there and drag your feet and wait on it to actually go down and be signed into law before saying something about it. But all of them are doing that. That's, that's what they've been doing. But uh, praise the Lord, this vindicated us. You know, because we've been saying for decades what the 501c3 was about and how it was going to become an actual permanent law. And then it did. But still, now we're still a cult and a bunch of idiots, right? But that's the world. That's how it works. It's the age of lying. And, and by the way, when he signed that bill, you know, check out online, search the date, December 7th, 2017. He did this on Sabbath day. 
All these five, think about that. He does this, it's a snub against our God, our Creator, our Savior. All these 501c3 pastors can now legally lobby for, Christ, you know, for uh, religious laws. So now do you see why so much religious talk is appearing in the politics again? I mean, if not, check out my religious laws page, or my religious laws are coming page for hundreds of articles. Uh, and I only started compiling them when I knew Trump was going to win the election a few months before he did, because it was obvious where everything was going with the religious panter. And when he finally did, then I post, posted the articles the very day he was inaugurated. So I already had a dozen or so articles. Now I can't remember. There's quite a few on there now. It's on uh, remedagod.org forward slash religiopolitical.htm, all one word. Religiopolitical. And then check out, the when you get time, also the Sunday Laws Are Coming page, where I have thousands of articles and videos that I've been compiling since June of 2012. That's the Sabbath Attack page. That's remedagod.org forward slash sabbatech.htm. That's S-A-B-A-T-A-K. I purposely misspelled it. So, but anyway, here's the, the finalization of what I'm going to share from SOP on this. And she says, they must act. They must take hold of the work themselves and earnestly cry to God for a true knowledge of themselves. The scenes which are passing before us are of sufficient magnitude to cause us to arouse and urge the truth home to the hearts of all who will listen. The harvest of earth is nearly ripe. Now think about this as well. The pinching hunger that Sister White saw during the Civil War. Why do you suppose that was? Because the people weren't, they weren't ready. They weren't self-sufficient. People know about how the, some of us, like I've got solar panels. I had a windmill, but the thing, the, the brake went out on it, so now it's useless. And I ain't climbing that pole. I'm not as young as I used to be. And so, but I, I have the solar panels. You got a motor home with a generator if I need electricity, like if the solar panels can't handle it all, because I only got four batteries on it and I only got uh, three panels. That's all I need to keep the servers running. But when, the, when we go offline permanently, hey, we got lights. Because an LED light, what is it, seven and a half watts? Yeah, we'll have light all day long. And uh, the only problem is, you know, every now and then I have to go in the basement and MacGyver the well pump to be able to kick water into the house. And uh, that's probably going to be like eight amps, and so that'll take a large portion of the batteries. So I'd only do that for ten minutes. And my wife and I, as some of you have already started doing as well, praise the Lord, uh, we do our own garden every year. And so when it comes time to where they destroy the economy and the store shelves are, are, are empty, yeah, we're going to be eaten. We're going to be fine. You know? This, all this craziness that's going on out there is for the people that don't read Bibles. Why? Well, it makes it that much easier to get them to stand in line to receive the mark. Those of us that know what's coming have prepared. When we can't buy and sell, it's not like well, we won't have to then. Well, well, you can't get to the store. Who cares? I'm going to go in my backyard, yank off and hear a corn and go get something to eat. So in closing, and please hear me when I say this seriously, please focus for a moment. If the Pope gets his way to have the one world government by 2030, that means, brothers and sisters, that we are going to be in New Jerusalem in just nine years. Come on, it's got to sober some people up. It's got to wake them up. I mean, did you, did you hear me? It's not, it is not time, I mean, is it not time to work in one as many as we can right now? We have this understanding because we understand prophecy. Everybody on the street is not even going to have a clue about this. It's not easy to start this conversation on the, on the street and don't even bother with the 2027 thing. I just jump right to the 2030 thing because they've got to set things up at 2027 so as to have. Because 2027 is just going to be their stepping stone to 2030. You know, with, because 2027 is when he starts enforcing the mark by saying you can't buy and sell anything unless you agree with Sunday laws because Satan is now standing next to him acting like he's Jesus and saying, yeah, I, never, I, I changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And the only reason that's happening is because we have been blessed with the latter rain and we have been going out and telling everybody about Sunday laws and is the mark of the beast and the Seventh-day Sabbath is the seal of God. It's right there in commandment number four. I got a video just about that, you know, that statement in commandment number four where it talks about um, the name, title, and territory of the Creator. 
just like the name, title, and territory of a president when he makes when he seals a, a, a bill into law. He has to put name, title, and territory. Well, that's what our God did in commandment number four, so we know where the seal is of his law. But most people don't know this, but we do. And we know if the Pope gets his way, we're out of here in nine years. Well, actually, we're going to... Okay, yeah, we're out of here in nine years, but in eight years, the plagues begin. Because the plagues last within... They, they fall within a day. And a day equals a year. It's right there in prophecy, right? And so I really hope and I pray that you were blessed by what was shared this Sabbath day. I'll be back in a minute.